This is the Pixel, Google's newest flagship to come with the latest Android operating system, Android Nougat, built by HTC, and a bump in specs making it a top competitor in the world of smartphones. Let's see if it holds up to the hype. So this year, Google released two flagships at the same time, just like last year, but this time they're not your typical Nexuses. The Pixel and Pixel XL is what they're calling it. I'm going to be focusing on the regular Pixel, hence the title of this video, but just off my first impressions, I will confidently tell you that this is a phone worth considering, and I'll explain why later on. Let's start it off with the design. Historically speaking, Google has always been working with third-party manufacturers for their smartphone lineups, and this year it's HTC. This is what they brought us. A light but solid design with an aluminum encasing. Honestly, it feels great in the hand. All my fingers line up perfectly with the buttons on the side and the fingerprint sensor on the back. At first, it may seem a bit too small if you're switching from a larger device such as the Nexus 6P or Galaxy S7 Edge, but that's why they have the XL, which is a bit bigger at 5.5 inches. You also can't miss that rounded rectangle glass on the back, giving it a nice accent that really makes this phone unique. But if that window wasn't there and the G logo was cleaned off, you could honestly mistake this as an iPhone. So the antenna bands, front facing earpiece, and giant space taking chin reminds me of an iPhone without a home button. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. But that's not a bad thing, I still love how this phone looks and feels in the hand. The buttons are very tactile and clicky, there's no camera bump so this phone doesn't rock from side to side when it's flat on its back. And the fingerprint sensor is decent letting you unlock your device in a second, but it's not the fastest one out there. My only gripe about the design is that it's very slippery and scratches and fingerprints on the back glass are inevitable, so I decided to pick up a dbrand skin. It gives the phone a bit more grip and with tons of skins to choose from, I didn't have a problem finding one that suited me best. I'll drop a link down below. Anyway, moving on to the display, it's a 5 inch 1080p AMOLED panel. You can bump that up to a 5.5 inch Quad HD AMOLED display if you get the XL. But overall, I'm very satisfied at how bright and vivid these pixels get in outdoor lighting. It's not going to outshine some of the best panels on the market, such as the Galaxy S7, but it does come close. Viewing angles are great, colors are a bit oversaturated, but there is an sRGB mode in the developer settings for a more accurate look, but it's not going to be as dramatic as a Samsung Galaxy display. And at 1080p, you can expect some great battery life and performance, as it's not pushing out as many pixels. Watching videos and playing games on this screen is very intriguing, and the downward facing speakers also add to that experience. Sure, it's not a front facing stereo, like the Nexus 6P, nor is it louder, but it definitely sounds more natural. It's less distorted at its high points, and still gets decently loud. So the speakers, they're not going to disappoint, but it's not going to be something to get hyped about. What is going to hype you up is the software. As we all know, Android 7.1, otherwise known as Android Nougat, is a huge step up from Marshmallow, and the Google Pixel is the only way to experience all these new features, as some are exclusive to this phone. One of the game changers is the on-screen navigation bar. With the white buttons being completely filled in, you get a neat animation when you tap on the home button, and if you long press it, Google Assistant will pop up. Essentially, it's a replication of Google Now in a conversation format, allowing you to ask it anything, and it will try to find it in the web. It can also tell you jokes, play mini games, search nearby restaurants, give you flight information, and much more. It's still in its early stages, so there's a limit as to what you can ask it to do. For example, it can't identify what songs are currently playing. You can't order an Uber. Gmail integration is very limited, so it can't tell you where your package is or what your recent purchases on Amazon were. And there are a couple more missing features. That's not to say Google Assistant is a horrible chatbot, and it's definitely useful, but it's going to take some time before it stops saying, I can't do that yet. And if you're wondering what happened to Now on Tap, it's still there, you just have to swipe up when Google Assistant appears, and it's now called Screen Search. Another obvious change is the Pixel Launcher. It features rounded icons, new animations, the swipe up gesture for the app drawer, and beautiful live wallpapers that make it seem like you're overlooking the horizon, or the White Haven Beach in Australia, or even the world. Plus, with launcher shortcuts, you can long press on an icon to bring up narrow commands. For example, if you long press on YouTube, you can tap on trending to automatically take you to all the trending YouTube videos, or if you long press on your phone, you can speed dial some of your favorite contacts. I think it's a very creative feature, but I'm not sure if I would use these all the time, unless I happen to memorize what shortcuts each app provides. With that being said, the Pixel Launcher is a great home setup to start off with, but third-party launchers such as Nova or Action Launcher they still provide more customizable options, so it honestly comes down to opinion on what launcher you would most likely stick with. 
If you jump into the settings, there's even more nougat goodness, such as moves, which is basically quick gestures. The only new thing here is you can drop down the notification and quick settings panel by swiping down on the fingerprint sensor or swipe up to close it. All the other gestures were already possible, they're just in a more centralized area now. There's also a nightlight feature to tint your screen red and reduce strain on your eyes at night, an enhanced Google backup that now automatically stores your apps, app data, contacts, SMS, Wi-Fi passwords, call history, and settings all on Google Drive, and a support section to call or chat with a Google representative whenever you need help with your device. Not to mention that there's also minor changes that are worth noting, such as the blue accents all around the UI, new animations when you tap or swipe on something, and a restart button in the power control menu. I honestly love the software. I know I didn't cover every NuGet characteristic, but with all these exclusive Pixel features and design aspects this device comes with, it's not a huge shock that Google's stock interface is one of the main reasons anyone should go out and get this device. So we get it, Android 7.1 is great on the Pixel, but can it handle all these bells and whistles? Well, with the Snapdragon 821 chip and 4GB of RAM, I personally haven't experienced any stutters or lag when navigating throughout the UI. The phone itself just flies. Application reload time is fast, animations are buttery smooth, hell, even Snapchat doesn't lag and that says a lot. Playing games on this device is no different. The Adreno 530 GPU handled those intense graphics like a boss. Though I have heard different stories about the XL, David over at Android Police says the phone is still really fast, but it does stutter a bit from time to time and it rarely happens. My best prediction would have to be that bigger quality display. If you combine Qualcomm's latest processor and 4GB of RAM with a 1080p display, performance is going to be stellar. Just take a look at the OnePlus 3. That's exactly what OnePlus did at the time of its release and no one has ever complained about the performance. So even though the resolution is lowered on the Pixel, performance will be a great benefit from this loss. Another great benefit is the battery life. Now keep in mind that battery performance varies for every user, so this is what I experienced. With 2,770 milliamp hours, it does seem like that won't be enough, but it is. I could easily get through an entire day with regular usage at 4.5 to 5 hours of screen on time. I usually have Wi-Fi enabled when possible, Bluetooth turned on at all times for my Moto 360, location for navigational purposes, and brightness turned almost to the max. I don't play games that often, but I do scroll through tons of social media feeds, text a lot, and watch YouTube. Jumping to the camera, Google has been rapidly improving their smartphone cameras over the last few years, and this year I think they nailed it. The rear camera has 12 megapixels, an f2.0 aperture lens, face detection and laser autofocus, and dual LED flash. Even though those are the exact same specs on the Nexus 6P, you should keep in mind that the Pixel has an upgraded Sony sensor and SME HDR technology for faster HDR Plus processing. In other words, this camera is one of the fastest picture shooters on a smartphone. Photos come out looking phenomenal with plenty of fine detail and natural looking colors. It does seem a bit saturated, but not excessively like the Galaxy S7. And even in low light situations, the detail and colors still held up quite well with little to no noise softening or blown out highlights. When shooting a video in 4K resolution, the gyroscope based software stabilization provides one of the best stabilized footages I have ever seen on a smartphone. It almost seems like a cameraman used a handheld stabilizer or even a tripod. In the end, the rear camera on both pixels are great competitors alongside the Galaxy S7 and the iPhone 7. And we can't forget about that 8 megapixel front facing camera which also takes some solid selfies. Other things worth mentioning is that the Pixel works on all US major carriers, it utilizes UFC 2.0 storage for faster app installs and photo captures, and supports NFC. What it doesn't have is water resistance, wireless charging, a micro SD card slot, and no 64GB model, only 32 and 128. Which brings me to my last topic, the price tag. At $650, you can get the smaller 32GB variant. If you want a lot more space, you can pay $100 more for 128GB. If you want to get a bigger display and a lot more battery capacity, aka the Pixel XL, you can pay another $120, making it as low as $770 and as high as $870. Yes, I know that's a bit on the pricey side, but if you're rocking a 2-year-old device or had to return your Note 7, and you're looking for an upgrade that will most likely last you another 2 years, the Pixel gets the job done. You definitely won't have a problem with the software or have to worry about not getting any major software updates for the next two years. The camera will amaze you, the display and design is a subtle touch, and the battery should get you through an entire day. 
If you're coming from a Nexus 6P or Galaxy S7, unless you really want those Pixel exclusive features, I would just hold on for now because it's not going to feel like a huge upgrade. The bump in specs are nice on paper, but when you actually use it, it'll feel like any other flagship released this year. Still, I really like what the Google Pixel provides, and because of that, I plan on using this as my daily driver. Well, that's my full review of the Google Pixel. Let me know in the comments if you'll be upgrading to the Pixel anytime soon, and make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Check out AndroidPolice.com for some great Android news, and I will see you guys in the next one.